Hi everyone, welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor has made startling claims about the toll of casualties in Ukraine, suggesting that nearly 400,000 individuals have been wounded, with a grim prognosis for many unable to return to military service due to severe injuries. While some reports allege he stated that 257,000 Ukrainians have perished, including soldiers and civilians, this figure remains unverified. However, it underscores the immense human cost of the conflict. With only an estimated 18 to 22 million people remaining under Zelensky's authority, comparable to the population of the Netherlands, sustaining the war effort becomes increasingly challenging. He asserts that the CIA has a history of misleading the public, particularly regarding events in Russia and Ukraine. He questions the credibility of such sources and dismisses the expertise of individuals like Devine on Russian affairs. Expressing concern for Ukraine's future, he predicts its imminent collapse under Russian pressure. He believes Russia's approach is methodical, aiming to systematically dismantle Ukrainian resistance. He criticizes conditions for negotiations, arguing that demanding Russian withdrawal from Ukraine and Crimea is unrealistic. He highlights Ukraine's demographic challenges, emphasizing its low birth rate and the toll of the war. He dismisses notions of a weakened Russia, citing positive economic indicators and geopolitical implications of Russia's stability. He warns against the consequences of destabilizing Russia, particularly in eastern Siberia and Central Asia, where Russian influence serves as a stabilizing force against potential intervention from other actors. He discusses Nassim Taleb's views on finance and highlights the disconnect between policymakers in Washington, D.C. and Europe, who are willing to continue the war in Ukraine without personal risk. He credits Taleb for addressing this issue and notes the significance of his Croatian background in understanding Russia's non-communist nature and aversion to imperialism. Drawing from Russian sentiments, emphasizes their desire for self-governance and criticizes Western threats to dismantle their country. He suggests that while some in Germany may support such actions, many are apprehensive due to historical cooperation between Berlin and Moscow for European peace. Reflecting on past alliances, he questions the current approach of supporting Ukraine against Russia and predicts the potential downfall of NATO. He assesses the inadequacy of Western military capabilities in the region and attributes the escalation of the conflict to misinterpretations of Russian strength. He warns of Russia's growing military power and their strategic caution amidst unpredictable Western leadership. Schultz's actions align with his long-standing approach, shaped by decades, in a relatively stable post-Cold War era. He reflects a mindset where the Yaes is seen as the world's dominant force, justifying aggressive actions against those who oppose it. However, such views are disconnected from reality, and he predicts Schultz's tenure won't last, nor will that of his foreign minister. He contrasts their rhetoric with the historical prudence of German statesmen and dismisses their reckless remarks. He explains the current military strategy in Ukraine, likening it to past campaigns in Iraq, the Balkans, and World War II, where critical infrastructure was systematically targeted to weaken adversaries. This approach, he argues, is necessary to prepare Ukraine for impending offenses and denies opponents the comfort of normalcy before a significant ground assault. Regarding the ongoing conflict, he outlines a shift in Moscow's objectives from seeking negotiation to strategic defense and economy of force, with a likely major offensive looming in the coming weeks. He emphasizes the precision of modern military capabilities, noting the ability to strike targets with minimal collateral damage, thus justifying recent actions near the Polish border as not reckless, but strategically precise. No, that's not entirely accurate, 
because the power stations and distribution networks were targeted within these areas, but the intention wasn't total destruction. If they wanted to level everything, they could have done so swiftly. The nuclear power plant of significant concern is located to the south near Zaporizhzhia, which the Russians are safeguarding. Ukrainian attempts to target this plant aim to provoke a nuclear crisis, a scenario they believe would benefit them. The focus isn't solely on preventing Ukrainians from utilizing these facilities, but also on protecting them from Ukrainian attacks. However, connectivity between these plants in Ukraine has been severed, leading to widespread disruptions in daily life, affecting transportation, water supply, agriculture, and livestock. The cascading effects have severely impacted the Ukrainian economy, with output nearly non-existent. Regarding military strategy, experts note the significance of weather and terrain in Ukraine. The fertile black earth topsoil, ranging from 4 to 15 feet deep, plays a vital role in the region's productivity, but poses challenges when unfrozen. With temperatures dropping below freezing, a significant offensive could occur between December 10th, Thieth, and 19th Thieth, with an estimated 540,000 Russian troops deployed, along with various armoured vehicles, artillery, missiles, drones, and aircraft equipped with precision munitions. He discusses the ongoing effort to provide more equipment to the Ukrainians amidst reports of devastating casualties, particularly in recent months. He dismisses claims of heavy Russian casualties, emphasizing the significant disparity in losses between Russian and Ukrainian forces' forces, which doesn't hinder the former's capabilities. The Ukrainian military is described as severely depleted with shortages in ammunition, spare parts, and trained personnel. The influx of untrained reservists into defensive positions reflects the dire situation. In advising policymakers, he suggests presenting a truthful assessment of the Russian forces' concentration and capabilities alongside the modest capabilities of the Ukrainian military. He highlights the deteriorating conditions in Ukraine with even prominent figures by Klitschko urging citizens to seek shelter elsewhere due to anticipated shortages of essential resources. The potential influx of millions of refugees into neighboring countries is foreseen as a looming humanitarian crisis. Privately, he believes policymakers acknowledge the flawed approach but lack a viable alternative plan. The absence of a clear objective beyond bolstering the Ukrainian military against Russia's perceived threat underscores the lack of foresight. He suggests a possible doubling down current strategies, driven by ideological fervor but lacking a realistic path to success. Regarding the situation in Ukraine, he likens it to the last days of Pompeii, where blame is sought amidst inevitable catastrophe. He doubts Zelensky's effective control, suggesting nationalist forces are increasingly dominant. Most of the Russian combat forces have withdrawn for rest and refit, with the current fighting in Donbass, led by Chechen and Separatist forces, supported by mercenaries and artillery. He anticipates a he's becoming massive offensive, led by the refreshed Russian army, focused on consolidating control over strategic Ukrainian territories like Kharkiv and Odessa. He indicates that Ukraine's independence is acceptable to Putin as long as it doesn't become a tool for Western interests or a threat to Russia. While he privately expresses indifference towards Ukraine's European Union membership, his primary concern lies with the possibility of NATO's involvement, particularly with a well-equipped Ukrainian military funded by the West. This prospect that worries European powers like Berlin and Rome as perpetual conflict with Russia could ensue. He suggests that if the situation becomes untenable for Russia due to external pressures, they may take action to resolve the crisis within next month. He emphasizes the influence of presidential preferences on intelligence reports and laments 
the lack of truthfulness in decision making, attributing it to a misplaced sense of invulnerability and power. He criticizes the hawkish rhetoric towards Russia, exemplified by recent statements from former Secretary of State Pompeo, and underscores the need for a realistic assessment of national capabilities and challenges. He believes that the current administration's aggressive stance towards Russia overlooks the nation's changed status since the end of the Cold War. Regarding the military, he expresses concern over recent changes in leadership and policies that prioritize diversity over performance, suggesting it undermines morale and effectiveness. He illustrates this with a hypothetical scenario of an unconventional official commander's appointment, highlighting concerns about misplaced priorities in the armed forces. He believes that the armed forces are already experiencing the negative consequences of changing recruitment standards, resulting in the acceptance of individuals who would not have been considered previously. This shift, he argues, reflects a belief that traditional measures of qualification are irrelevant in an era dominated by technological warfare and national power. Additionally, he suggests that there is a deliberate effort to reshape the armed forces to align with leftist ideology, replacing traditional values with new ones. Dot regarding Lloyd Austin, he expresses bewilderment at the former's apparent disdain for the military institution and the American people. He criticizes senior officers for passively accepting destructive directives that undermine morale, cohesion, and discipline within the ranks, noting a decline in the chain of command's authority compared to previous years. He highlights the disconnect between the military's core mission of defending the nation and recent trends in recruitment videos, which focus less on combat readiness and more on unrelated social messages. When discussing financial assistance to Ukraine, he reveals that a significant portion of the aid allocated for military equipment remains within the United States as funds are directed towards defense contractors who supply the requested weaponry. He suggests that this process serves various interests beyond simply supporting Ukraine's defense capabilities, including political considerations and economic incentives for constituents and industries.